Let's turn in the Word of God this morning to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. We'll read the entire chapter. The text for the sermon is going to be a significant part of the chapter, the first two-thirds of it, the first 23 verses. I'll explain that in the beginning of the sermon. So we won't reread anything. Let's read together the entire chapter. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have continual heaviness and con- great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. And neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we then say? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the Scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show His wrath and to make His power known, endured with much long-suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that He might make known the riches of His glory on the vessels of mercy, which He had afore prepared unto glory? Even us, whom He hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles, as he saith also in Osi, or Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said 
before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed. We had been as Sodom and been like unto Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Sion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So far we read the holy and inspired Word of God. As I said, the text is a significant portion of the chapter, the first two-thirds of it, to around verse 23. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, we continue this morning a series of sermons that we began a couple of weeks ago under the title and theme, Saved by Grace. We began that series a couple of weeks ago with a sermon on the doctrine of election as it is taught very clearly and thoroughly in Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 through 5. I want to continue that sermon series this morning, and we're doing that in the place of the Lord's Day in light of my classical appointment this evening. Every once in a while, I intend to do that so that we can make some good progress in this series, and the fact is there are many classical appointments, and so not every time, but sometimes we'll preach a series instead of the Lord's Day in light of that. We began a couple of weeks ago in the doctrine of election because of the truth of the Canons of Dort that states that election is the source of every saving benefit in Jesus Christ. And so though the series of sermons specifically is going to be on the application of salvation to the believer, it's well and good to lay the foundation correctly. And the foundation is in God's eternal decree of election. In the sermon this morning, we follow that with another sermon that deals with the subject of election in connection with the doctrine of reprobation. Now this is not absolutely necessary. It's not necessarily because of the main point of the series, which is saved by grace, the application to the believer. Nevertheless, I wanted to take the time to preach a sermon on election in connection with the doctrine of reprobation. And there are good reasons to do that. One of the good reasons to do that, very simply, is that we are called to preach the entire counsel of God. This is not, beloved, a doctrine that one is naturally inclined to preach on. And one is not naturally inclined to listen to. It's a hard doctrine. But the Word of God clearly teaches Not only divine election, but necessarily with that divine reprobation. And what 2 Timothy 3 teaches us concerning the Word of God is that it's all inspired. And it's therefore all profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness that we as believers might be truly furnished unto all good works. This Word of God taught in Romans 9 that declares election in connection with reprobation is part of the divinely inspired Word of God. 
And this Word of God is profitable. So for that reason, it's good for us to hear a sermon on election in connection with reprobation. In the second place, it's good to hear a sermon on this subject because the series is naturally going to lead to certain questions, important questions. It's going to lead us to ask the question, whom is it that does not receive the blessings of life? It's going to lead to the question, why is it that some do not receive the blessings of salvation? The entire series is going to be on the application of Christ's salvation to the believer. Whom is it that does not receive that? And why do they not receive that? The answer to those questions in the deepest sense is found in the truth of the Word of God in Romans chapter 9. The answer to those questions in the deepest sense is God's eternal decree of election. And with that, God's decree of reprobation. And so as we progress in this series of sermons, this truth taught in Romans 9 is important for us in order to understand the answers to those very important questions. And in the third place, it's good for us to hear a sermon on election in connection with reprobation because it serves the purpose of what is the main theme of this series of sermons. The main theme captured in the title of the series, Saved by Grace. Where we will be led in this sermon this morning is where the Apostle leads us in Romans chapter 9. That God's decree of election in connection with reprobation has as its purpose by God to manifest the riches of God's glory to us in Jesus Christ. That is the prophet of the Word of God to us as believers this morning. The prophet is that you and I will be humbled. The prophet, by God's grace, is that you and I will be led to be thankful. The prophet is that we will be led to praise and extol God for who He is as God, the Almighty, Sovereign, Potter, who by His grace has determined to make vessels of honor prepared for glory. In light of that, let's consider this truth in Romans 9 under the theme, the Sovereign Potter. Let's see two points to the sermon this morning. The first, the Sovereign Decree. And the second, the Sovereign Purpose. The approach of this sermon is going to be a bit different than what we are used to. The approach to this sermon is going to be to consider a significant part of Romans chapter 9. The first two-thirds of the chapter. It is said concerning Romans 9 that it's the most avoided chapter in the Bible. We will not this morning avoid Romans 9. Instead, we are going to dive deep into Romans 9. And we dive deep into Romans 9 with a spirit of humility. A humility that bows before God as it is revealed in this particular chapter. It's the most avoided chapter in the Bible because man naturally does not want to hear and does not want to believe what God says to us in Romans chapter 9. Because in the end, what Romans chapter 9 teaches as its grand main point is that God is God. And God is the absolutely sovereign God of all of salvation. Rooted in His decree of election and reprobation. And what I want to do, therefore, this morning is 
take a broad approach to considering this chapter as a whole, or at least the first two-thirds of the chapter. It's critically important for us to understand Romans 9. To understand the, the thought that is developed in the chapter as a whole. So instead of going to one verse and diving deep into that verse, which is often what we do with an epistle, what we're going to do is step back and see what is God teaching us in this chapter? And where does it lead in its conclusion? And that's what we're going to end on in the sermon. The purpose of God in election and reprobation and the purpose of God that has its profit for you and for me this morning. And so we're going to take this broad approach and consider the first 23 or 24 verses in the chapter as a whole. And so let's begin that. But before we go into it specifically, let's be reminded of the main doctrines that are being expounded in the past sermon and in this sermon. The doctrine of election. The doctrine of election is the divine decree of God according to which He chose in eternity a particular people in Christ. Particular people that make up the body, which is the church, unto salvation. That's election. That's what we learned about a couple of weeks ago. That's what's going to be taught to us in this chapter in Romans 9 as well. Coupled with the divine decree of election is the divine decree of reprobation. And God's divine decree of reprobation is His decree according to which He appoints or ordains certain particular persons to the end of everlasting damnation and punishment in hell. Which damnation and punishment is because of and the just judgment of their unbelief and their sin. Divine reprobation is God's decree not to save certain persons in the Lord Jesus Christ, but instead, His divine decree according to which He appoints certain persons to the end of everlasting damnation in hell. Both of those are taught in Romans 9 and the advantage of taking the chapter as a whole is we'll be able to see certain elements of that, not just from a verse, but from several verses. Understand, beloved, that the divine decree of reprobation is not only taught in Romans chapter 9. Let me point out just two other verses in this connection. 1 Peter chapter 2 says in verse 7, Unto you therefore which believe He is precious, but unto them which are disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the stame, is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the Word, being disobedient. And now this, whereunto also they were appointed. Appointed to the end that they would be this disobedient people who stumble at the rock of Jesus Christ. One more verse is Jude chapter four or chapter one, the only chapter, verse four, where it says this concerning false teachers who crept into the church, that they are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Certain men ordained to this condemnation. That's the divine decree of reprobation. Just two passages in addition to Romans chapter 9. Now let's go through the chapter as a whole. We're going to work our way through in the remainder of this first point of the sermon, five sections 
in Romans 9 that ends with verse 23. So that we have a clear presentation of Paul's main point, inspired by the Spirit, of God's teaching in this Word. It begins with the first five verses. The first five verses sets up the entire teaching of the chapter. In the first five verses, the Apostle Paul sets forth something that is very personal. He sets forth the deep sorrow of heart that he is experiencing. Paul was a man like you and me. Yes, he was mighty in the Scriptures. Yes, he was bold as an apostle of Jesus Christ. But he was a man. He was a man who experienced deep emotional trouble just like we do. And he expresses that as he stands before God in verse 2. That I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Now the reason Paul has this deep sorrow in his heart is that he sees and he knows something. What he sees and he knows is that his fellow kinsmen, according to the flesh, that is, his fellow Jews, are lost spiritually and have rejected God and have denied Jesus Christ. And that causes Paul to be deeply, deeply sorrowful. He knows this to be true. He knows the Old Testament Scriptures, which exclaims so clearly the departure from the Lord by Israel, necessitating the two captivities of Israel and Judah. He himself, prior to his conversion, was part of this body that rejected Jesus Christ as the Messiah. He goes on his missionary journeys. He preaches the Gospel. And what does he see when he preaches that Gospel? He sees his fellow Jews who deny the Word of the Gospel that is proclaimed. He sees his fellow kinsmen according to the flesh lost spiritually. And it causes a deep sorrow of heart. And this was his wish and desire on account of that fact. He says in verse 3, For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. He says in response to that, Curse me instead for their well-being spiritually. He starts out very personal. This is a highly doctrinal chapter, but it starts out very personal. And that's important because what this does is it gives us the proper mindset as we approach this very hard doctrine of reprobation. We can relate to the Apostle Paul. Any father or mother who has a child walking in unbelief and sin, knows exactly what Paul is saying here. He's humbled by that. And says in response to that, curse me for their well-being. That's the desire of his heart. And so his approach to this entire doctrine set forth in Romans 9, the doctrine of God's absolute sovereignty in the decree of election and reprobation, his approach from a human point of view in his relationships is one of humility as he stands before God in this truth. One that we can very much understand and relate to. That's the first section. Verses 1-5. through And that fact that Paul sees so many of his fellow Jews rejecting God and rejecting Jesus Christ, spiritually lost, naturally leads to a question. And the question is, does that mean that the Word of God has failed? God is the God of His Word. The Word of His promise. 
And the word of God's promise is that He was the God of Israel. That He was the God of the Jews. The descendants of Abraham. That He would be their God and they would be His people. And now Paul sees so many of his Jews reject God and are spiritually lost and it leads to this question. Does that mean that God's Word of promise failed? And the answer to that is no. Of course not. God's Word and God's promise never fail. And that's the opening word of the second section in verses 6 through 9. It begins with verse 6, not as though the Word of God hath taken none effect. The reason so many of the Jews have rejected the Lord is not because God's Word failed. Instead, the reason is set forth in the next statement in verse 6. For they are not all Israel which are of Israel. That's the explanation for the deep sorrow of heart that Paul is experiencing. The reality that there were those who were part of Israel that were spiritually lost. In that statement, you have a differentiation between two groups of people. Two groups of people that have come forth from Abraham. There are those who are Israel. True Israel of God. And there are those who are but of Israel. So that in this second section, in Romans chapter 9, what the Apostle is doing is saying there are two groups that can be and must be identified in Old Testament Israel. True Israel and those who are of Israel. And what this means is that just because someone came physically from the loins of Abraham does not mean that by that fact they are automatically a child of God and the object of the saving love of God in Jesus Christ. Because coming from the loins of Abraham were two groups of persons. And we read that in this second section. We read in verse 8, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. Some are of Israel. Who are those who are of Israel? The children, as we read, of the flesh. What is true of those children of the flesh? They are not the children of God. That's one group. The other group set forth in these opening verses in 6-9, through nine, are the true Israel. And what does Paul say about them? We read, but at the end of verse 8, the children of the promise are counted for the seed. In distinction from the children of the flesh, there are the children of the promise. Those who come forth by the power of God's promise, and then having come forth by the power of that promise, are the objects of that promise of God. They are the true Israel. They are the recipients of the promise of God and salvation in Jesus Christ. And Paul demonstrates that by quoting Genesis chapter 1 concerning Isaac. In thy seed, Isaac's seed, shall thy people be called. And that's striking because what that does, the language of seed does, is bring us, for example, to Galatians 3, which talks about the seed of Abraham ultimately being Christ. 
And so right there you have this beautiful harmony between Genesis 21, Ephesians 1, Galatians 3, and Romans 9. The seed of Abraham and Isaac is Christ. Ephesians 1 chosen in Christ. And now Romans 9, an election that is ultimately therefore in Jesus Christ. This is the main point of the second section, verses 6-9. through Not all Israel which are of Israel, children of the flesh and children of the promise. That brings us to the third section, which is verses 10 through 13. And what the apostle does in verses 10 through 13, under the example of Jacob and Esau, is give unto us the deepest reason for this distinction of persons that came forth from Abraham. What is the deepest ground for their being children of the flesh and children of the promise. And the deepest reason for that, expressed in verses 10-13, through is God's decree of election. And with that decree of election, the decree of reprobation. Under the example of Jacob and Esau, Paul in verses 10 through 13 is saying, This is why, this is why there are these two groups. According to the decree of election, Jacob have I loved, a child of the promise. And according to the decree of reprobation, Esau have I hated, the child of the flesh. This is why they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Because God has decreed according to election to save some. And God has decreed according to reprobation to appoint others to everlasting damnation. We read in verse 11, For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of Him that calleth. Now it is true that in this section it's not mentioned that God reprobated explicitly. We have explicitly Esau have I hated, but the explanation is in terms of election. And there's reason for that. Not the least of which is that that's the point of this all. The grand point is Christ and salvation in Christ. And so that's the focus here when it comes to Jacob and Esau. But in teaching that the purpose of election might stand before they were born, neither done good or evil, what is taught in this section necessarily are both decrees. The divine decree of election and of reprobation. That God appoints some to damnation and God decrees to save some unto everlasting salvation. These few verses teach us a couple of important characteristics about both the decree of election and reprobation. I'd like to run through three of them very briefly. Number one, these verses teach us that the decrees are eternal. Verse 11, the children not yet born. And we know from other passages in God's Word that it's not just in time before they were born. But when we're talking about election and with that reprobation, we're talking about eternity. It's an eternal decree. Same thing we saw from Ephesians 1. Number two, take note of this important characteristic of both election and reprobation. They are unconditional. Notice that in verse 11. Neither having done any good or evil, or evil, 
neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand. It's unconditional, that decree of election and reprobation. What this means is that God did not look out into the future, see that Jacob would love him and obey him, and on the basis of that good, on the basis of that good, elect him unto salvation. That would be conditional election. Nor did God peer out into the future, see that Esau would reject God, and on the basis of that rejection of God, decree to reprobate him. Neither before they did good or evil. Those are the Arminian conceptions of both election and reprobation. Arminian conceptions that make it dependent upon man. But the truth of Romans 9, verses 10 through 13, is that apart from doing good or evil, God in eternity decreed some to everlasting salvation and appointed others to everlasting damnation. Yes, in the way of their sin and unbelief, which we'll get to, but the decree itself is a sovereign decree which has its deepest source in the good pleasure of God as God. Eternal, unconditional, in the third place, particular. We're dealing with particular persons here. Jacob, God loved according to the decree of election. The Jacob who came forth from the loins of Rebekah. Esau, hated according to the decree of reprobation. The man who came forth from the loins of his mother. Revelation 13 speaks about the names, the names that are not written in the Lamb's book of life. Let's summarize. Deep sorrow of heart sees his fellow Jews lost. Second section, two groups that explain that. Children of the promise, children of the flesh. Third section, the deepest reason for that differentiation, the deepest reason, God's decree of election and reprobation. Now we get to sections four and five, and this is where this is all driving to. And the theme of the sermon, the sovereign potter. That truth, just summarized in those three sections, leads the Apostle Paul to bring up two objections. Two objections to the divine decree of election and reprobation. Children of the promise, children of the flesh. And so let's see those two objections. The first one is verses 14 through 18. And it begins with these words, What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? This is the objection to the truth just stated. Does this make God unrighteous? That is to say, does this make God unfair? Does this make God unjust for Him in eternity before they did good or evil to elect one unto everlasting salvation and reprobate the other to everlasting damnation. Does that not make God an unjust God? Now before we answer that, it is incredibly important to see what the answer that the Apostle gives is not. The answer to the question, is God fair? Paul does not answer that 
by saying he is fair. And let me tell you why he is fair. He is fair because Esau sinned and rejected God. And on the basis of what Esau did, he divinely decreed him to everlasting damnation. And he's fair because look at what Jacob did. Jacob loved God. And on the basis of that, he elected him unto everlasting salvation. That, beloved, is not the answer to the question. If the conception of the Scriptures was the Arminian conception of conditional election and reprobation, this question, is not God unfair, would be the softball question, so to speak, for the Apostle to explain conditional election and reprobation. That's what would make it fair, supposedly. They're getting what they did and the result of that. But that's not the answer. That's not the answer to the charge that God is unjust. Let's see what the answer is. This is the answer from verse 14. The most important beginning. God forbid. God forbid. It starts there. God forbid that you would even think that God is unfair. For God to be unjust, unrighteous, would for God to cease to be God as God. God as God is always just, always righteous, and always perfect in all of His ways. That's the fundamental answer. But the Apostle goes on to explain why God is not unjust. And the essence of the explanation is found in the sovereignty of God. This is the explanation with respect to election, verses 15 and 16. Why is God not unrighteous? Because He's God. And for God to be God, this is what He does. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So it's not of Him that willeth, nor of Him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. With respect to election, God is completely fair because He as God operates as God and has mercy on whom He will have mercy. And so it's not of man who wills the Arminian choosing or man that runs the Roman Catholic doing, but it's God who shows mercy. That's why God is just. Because He's God and has chosen to do that. But then he goes also and explains why God is fair with respect to reprobation and God's purpose in that. That's verses 17 and then the summary in verse 18. For the Scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy and whom he will he hardeneth. God in His sovereignty according to the decree of reprobation, works out in time and history such that He hardens whom He will harden. The prime example given in the passage, Pharaoh. Because God as sovereign has the prerogative as God to do that. The answer to the objection is God unfair in the divine decree of election and reprobation is no. Why? Because He's sovereign. He will have mercy on whom He will have mercy. He will harden whom He will harden. The one according to the divine decree of election. The other according to the divine decree of reprobation. I say again, we stand humbly before God in the truth of what Romans 9 teaches.
And that's required all the more as we see the second objection, the fifth and final section that we are running through. The final objection, verses 20 through 23 or 24, begins this way. Or rather, 19 through 23 begins this way. Thou wilt then say unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Beloved, God saw to it that this verse and the answer to this verse would be in the sacred Scriptures. God saw to it because this is always what unbelieving man says in response to the doctrine of election and reprobation. This is always where it goes back to where unbelieving man who will not humble himself before Almighty God but exalts himself above God and places God at the judgment of his own human mind, always goes to this objection. And the main idea is this. It's according to God's decree. A sovereign decree worked out in time and in history such that even God hardens the heart of unbelieving man. How, this is the objection, how can God yet then find fault with Him? Because who can resist that will of God? That's the objection. And that's the objection that unbelieving man always comes back to. It's God's fault. Now look at the answer. Look at the answer in verse 20. Again, a most important beginning. Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Who are you, man? Puny man to reply, to contend against Almighty God. Don't forget, beloved, who we're dealing with and don't forget who you are and who I am. You want to talk about the prophet according to 2 Timothy 3 to the teaching of Romans 9. The prophet is that it puts us in our place. We stand humbly before the Word of God. And we don't contend with God. And we don't bring God to our judgment and our determination of what is right and wrong according to our human mind. But we stand humbly before the living God for who He is as God. That's the first answer. But then he goes on and says this, Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? Again, what's the answer to the charge? The answer to the first charge, God is unjust, is this. God is sovereign. The answer to the second charge, how can He find fault? is the exact same thing. God is sovereign. Who are you, man, to contend against God? And he builds on that and says, you are a vessel. You are the result of the potter's work. And the potter is the one who of the same lump has the power to make some vessels unto honor and some vessels unto dishonor. He has the power to do it. And literally in the text when we read that, it's the right to do it. The authority to do it. God as the sovereign potter has the right and authority as God out of the same lump to make some vessels unto honor. Their end is honor and glory and salvation and some vessels unto dishonor. And their end is 
everlasting destruction in hell. This is the sovereign prerogative of God. Beloved, this is the Word of God. It's clear. And it places us before the absolute sovereignty of God in all things. And in particular, God's sovereignty as to why there are those who are Israel and those who are but of Israel. Why there are the children of the promise and the children of the flesh. Why there are vessels of honor and there are vessels of dishonor. Why there are those on whom God has mercy and those whom God hardens. It's because God is God. And God as God has decreed in eternity to save some according to election and others not to according to reprobation. Now we need to get to the second point of the sermon. The second point of the sermon is God's sovereign purpose in this. God has a purpose in what we just explained in the first point. And the purpose, we can say generally, is to reveal His glory as God. That is the highest purpose of all things. That God would make Himself known as the glorious God and the one only true and living God of heaven and earth. So that all of His decrees and all of His works in time and history have that as their purpose. And we can't let that become cliche-ish to us. To the glory of God. We say that, we pray that, we think that. But don't let that become a cliche that we just say or just think. Because truly, beloved, there is no higher purpose, no greater end than the glory of God. And this was the determination of God. That He would create a world over which He was entirely sovereign. And in that world, there would be light and darkness. In that world, there would be sin and salvation. In that world, there would be death and there would be life. And all of that has as its purpose the sending of Jesus Christ in light of those realities, that antithesis, so that God, in the fullness of His being as God, will be honored and glorified and revealed. That's the purpose of God's decree of election and reprobation. Let's see three things specifically. And I realize right now we're at seven minutes to 11. A couple of things here I need to explain in more detail. I wanted to get the full scope in this sermon. So let's see three things in conclusion as to the purpose. Number one, God's purpose of the divine decree of reprobation is that His power might be made known. Look at verse 17. Verse 17, this is an answer to the first objection that we talked about. We read, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. God had a purpose in reprobation. His purpose was that His power might be revealed in Pharaoh. God had a purpose so that Pharaoh would know. Pharaoh who thought he was filled with power. Pharaoh would know there is no power in you because I am the God of absolute power. And God raises up the reprobate according to His divine decree so that in them and through them, His power as God might be revealed. In other words, beloved, it is so that all men throughout the world may know God is God. And there's no power apart from the living God of heaven and earth. And what a display of that power it was. 
that is declared even to this day throughout the world and throughout the church. What an awesome display of the power of God in and through Pharaoh in his hardening his heart with the ten plagues, the ten plagues that revealed God as Almighty God and not just the God of power, but the God of salvation. For in that power, God revealed His saving work to His people in the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. So that briefly from that verse, the purpose of the divine decree of reprobation is that they are raised up so that the power of God might be revealed in and through God's dealings with them. Second purpose. In answer to the second objection, we read in verse 22, what if God willing to show His wrath and to make His power known endured with much long-suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. Here, we pull out the single point that the purpose of the divine decree of of reprobation is that the wrath of God might be revealed. The wrath of God. You see, God made all things in such a way that there is this light and this darkness. And this darkness which is sin has a purpose according to the will of God. And the purpose according to the will of God is that it would reveal God. It would reveal who God is in His holiness and righteousness. That's what the wrath of God does. His punishment of sin is the reflection of His holiness as God. And the purpose of all things according to God's will is that His being as God would be made known. For that holiness to be revealed in its hatred of sin, sin must be present. And sin is present according to divine decree, and those who walk in that sin, according to reprobation and the fall of Adam into sin. The purpose is the revelation of God's being in His wrath. Now let's make a couple of things very clear here. We cannot explain the fullness of what stands behind this right now. And a very significant part of this is how God created man. This does not make God the author of sin. And God Himself does not sin. God has decreed this in such a way that He Himself does not sin. He made man perfect according to His image in the beginning, but He's sovereign over that sin and in such a way that He hates that sin and punishes that sin in His righteousness as God. We cannot go down the path of charging God with injustice. And now this. Now this distinction. And then we'll have one more point. This distinction between the basis of two things. The basis on the one hand of the decree of God of reprobation and the basis on the other hand of the punishment of God in hell. The ground for those. I'll be very clear here. The basis of God's decree the decree to appoint some to everlasting damnation, the ground for that, the reason He does that, is His sovereign free good pleasure as God. It's not the evil and sin and unbelief of wicked man. He doesn't look ahead, see that they would walk in sin, and on that basis, appoint them to everlasting damnation. The decree, the decision, the 
appointment to everlasting damnation has as its deepest reason the sovereign good pleasure of God. That's Romans 9. The sovereign potter who has chosen to make some vessels to honor and some to dishonor. He did that in such a way that in time and history, man would fall into sin and that sin over which he is sovereign, but yet man willfully sinned, that sin becomes then the basis for the punishment. Those are two different things. This is very, very precise, but it's important. And it maintains the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man and the justice of God in all of his works. The ground for the decree, the decision, is God's sovereignty as God and His good pleasure. But in the way of their sin, and that sin, that unbelief, that unrighteousness, that becomes the just ground for God to damn them everlastingly in hell. We maintain from Romans 9, the absolute sovereignty of God and the full responsibility of man and the just judgment of God against sin. And when we read, for example, that God hardened the heart of Pharaoh, God never hardened that heart of Pharaoh in such a way that Pharaoh did not himself have a hard heart. He never looked at God and said, God, why are you doing this? I don't want to be hardened in my heart. No, he was willful. But God was sovereign over it all. The purpose, the revelation of God's power, the purpose, the revelation of God's wrath, which reveals His holiness as God. And the purpose in the third place, and this is where it all leads to, and that He might make known, verse 23, the riches of His glory on the vessels of mercy, which He hath afore prepared unto glory. Verse 23 says that God endures the wicked and God is long-suffering towards His people. Why does God not just destroy the wicked immediately? Why does God not just bring His people all to glory immediately? He endures and He's long-suffering. Why? Why? It's to this end, verse 23, that He might make known the riches of His glory on the vessels of mercy. The whole purpose of God's decree of reprobation is to make known all the more the glory of His riches to the vessels of mercy. Mercy, And here, the hugely significant point that reprobation serves election. Reprobation serves the purpose of magnifying the grace of God in election. Listen to the Canons of Dort in Article 15. What peculiarly tends to illustrate and recommend to us the eternal and unmerited grace of election is the express testimony of the sacred Scripture that not all, but some only, are elected, while others are passed by in the eternal election of God, who out of His just, it goes on to define reprobation. What illustrates election is reprobation. God makes known all the more the riches of His glory in Christ by enduring the vessels of dishonor and the vessels of wrath. Pharaoh, he didn't destroy him right away. Why? So that through him, what is revealed, God's riches of His glory to His people in Christ. During Christ's time, he didn't just destroy those leaders. He endured them. And they walked in their sin to lead to the crucifixion of Christ. To what end? It reveals the riches of God's glory in Jesus Christ. 
you and me, who with believing hearts never charge God with injustice, but know our own sin, see the vessels of wrath around us. We see the sin in which they walk with hard hearts. And we know out of faith, I am no different. I am a sinner. I willfully sin. And all of that that we see around us illustrates all the more the graciousness and the goodness of God to display unto us the riches of His glory in Jesus Christ. For the believer who knows their sin and stands humbly before God, the perspective of the believer is, I don't deserve anything from this God. But He has been pleased to give the riches of His glory to us in Christ. Riches of His glory. The manifestation of God, His brightness, His splendor, His magnificence. Christ is that. Christ is the reflection of the glory of God. And what is your salvation and my salvation as we cling to Him by faith? We're made to look like Him. Conform to His image. So that as we are conformed to the image of God in Christ, we have revealed to us and in us the riches of His glory in Him. The purpose is the manifestation of God's power and wrath, yes. But to the end of the glory of God to us His people in Jesus Christ. I say in conclusion, do not fear the mention of reprobation. I prayed that. Do not fear the mention of reprobation for those who desire have the full assurance of salvation, I commend to you the Canons of Dort, Article 16, where it teaches that God will not break and destroy His people. He will care for them as we persevere in the means of grace and as we look to the Lord Jesus Christ in whom these riches and glory are made manifest. Amen. Our Father in Heaven, we're thankful for Thy Word. It's a deep Word. It's a Word that our small minds struggle to understand in its depth and profound nature. But yet, we go to it, we expound it, we strive to understand it, and we do so to the end of the glory of Thy name. And so may Thy Word have been brought faithfully this morning to that end. And bless it for Jesus' sake. We pray this in His name. Amen.